Angel is saying to you, Great blessings are about to enter your life because you have believed for so long. You never gave up. You remained faithful. Your dedication, passion, and patience are about to pay off in a major way. Everything is about to make sense. 2024 is going to be one of the best chapters of your life. Embrace new opportunities and experiences that will bring you joy, fulfillment, and success. Today is going to be extraordinarily awesome. Don't accept where you are as your final destination. I have greater for you. Where I had you start is never where I intended for you to finish. In order to get to the next level, you must be willing to undergo transformation. I have a great plan for you and your future. Jeremiah 29 11. Accepting what you aren't willing to change will keep you stuck. It's time to move forward. You don't want anything from your past to sabotage your future. Never, ever forget this. God won't part the water in front of you until you take your first step. If you felt like you've wasted years of your life in the wrong job, hanging around the wrong people, doing the wrong things, God will gather those years and restore them back to you. He'll take those experiences that the enemy meant for your harm and turn them around for your good. He'll make you stronger, wiser, and better off than you were before. He can launch you further into your destiny than before. Be encouraged today because with God, all things are possible and nothing is ever wasted. Step back today. Thank God for His masterful sovereignty. You're not an accident. You're here for a meaningful God-given reason. Your worst moments of failure don't define you. Failure is not who you are. We all deny, crumble, and give up. But that never means it's over. God is a wonderful Father who will repeatedly pick you up and share His life with you. Despite the things you've done, you're never too far gone for Jesus to restore you and set you on the right path. He loves you too much to leave you where you are. He's always got more for you. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and He will grant you His blessing. For the scriptures say, If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil, and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and His ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns His face against those who do evil. Peter 3 9 12 NLT 1 Heavenly Father, in times of struggle, I seek Your breakthrough power. Your word declares in Isaiah 43, 19, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Grant me eyes to see the new paths you're paving and the courage to follow your lead. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, when I face obstacles, strengthen my faith in your promises. Your word in Mark 11.24 reassures me. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Help me trust that you are faithful to fulfill your word, and that breakthrough is within reach. In Jesus' name, Amen. Heavenly Father, when doubts assail me, let your peace guard my heart. As Philippians 4, 6, 7 teaches, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May your peace reign in my heart as I seek breakthrough. In Jesus' name, Amen. Being on a broken planet means you will never outgrow temptation. But it's important to remember that it's not a sin to be tempted. 
It's a sin to give in to temptations. You're not a bad Christian because you have persistent temptations in your life. You're human. You're not responsible for the thoughts Satan puts in your mind from a thousand different stimuli. But you are responsible for what you do with them. You can choose not to dwell on a thought. You change your mind. You choose to think of something different. Then, you have not sinned because you didn't act on your temptation. Martin Luther said, You can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. If you have a bad thought, don't be intimidated by it. Don't beat yourself up. That's what Satan wants you to do, because the more you get down on yourself, the more he can manipulate those negative emotions and lead you to sin. A thought is only a temptation. It's your choice whether it turns into a sin. You're going to be tempted the rest of your life. Even the oldest, most mature Christian in the world is still tempted. The mature Christian knows that the closer you get to God, the more Satan will throw at you, hoping something will stick. But the closer you get to God, the better prepared you are to face whatever Satan throws at you and to resist him. Don't be intimidated by Satan. As a Christian, you've got the Holy Spirit's power in you. You've got God's Word to give you truth. You've got Jesus to cry out to. You've got everything you need to overcome your temptations. My experience is not what makes redemption real. Redemption is reality. Redemption has no real meaning for me until it is worked out through my conscious life. When I am born again, the Spirit of God takes me beyond myself and my experiences and identifies me with Jesus Christ. If I am left only with my personal experiences, I am left with something not produced by redemption. But experiences produced by redemption prove themselves by leading me beyond myself to the point of no longer paying any attention to experiences as the basis of reality. Instead, I see that only the reality itself produced the experiences. My experiences are not worth anything unless they keep me at the source of truth, Jesus Christ. If you try to hold back the Holy Spirit within you with the desire of producing more inner spiritual experiences, you will find that he will break the hold and take you again to the historic Christ. Never support an experience which does not have God as its source and faith in God as its result. If you do, your experience is anti-Christian, no matter what visions or insights you may have had. Is Jesus Christ Lord of your experiences, or do you place your experiences above him? Is any experience dearer to you than your Lord? You must allow Him to be Lord over you and pay no attention to any over which He is not Lord. Then there will come a time when God will make you impatient with your own experience and you can truthfully say, I do not care what I experience, I am sure of Him. Be relentless and hard on yourself if you are in the habit of talking about the experiences you have had. Faith based on experience is not faith. Faith based on God's revealed truth is only faith there is. When God begins to draw me to Himself, the problem of my will comes in immediately. Will I react positively to the truth that God has revealed? Will I come to Him? To discuss or deliberate over spiritual matters when God calls is inappropriate and disrespectful to Him. When God speaks, never discuss it with anyone as if to decide what your response may be. See Galatians 1 15-16. Belief is not the result of an intellectual act, but the result of an act of my will whereby I deliberately commit myself. But will I commit, placing myself completely and absolutely on God, and be willing to act solely on what He says? If I will, I will find that I am grounded on reality as certain as God's throne. In preaching the gospel, always focus on the matter of the will. Belief must come from the will to believe.
There must be a surrender of the will, not a surrender to a persuasive or powerful argument. I must deliberately step out, placing my faith in God and in His truth. And I must place no confidence in my own works, but only in God. Trusting in my own mental understanding becomes a hindrance to complete trust in God. I must be willing to ignore and leave my feelings behind. I must believe. But this can never be accomplished without my forceful, determined effort to separate myself from my old ways of looking at things. I must surrender myself completely to God. Everyone has been created with the ability to reach out beyond his own grasp. But it is God who draws me, and my relationship to him in the first place is an inner, personal one, not an intellectual one. I come into the relationship through the miracle of God and through my own will to believe. Then I begin to get an intelligent appreciation and understanding of the wonder of the transformation in my life. The gospel of Jesus Christ always forces a decision of our will. Have I accepted God's verdict on sin as judged on the cross of Christ? Do I have even the slightest interest in the death of Jesus? Do I want to be identified with his death to be completely dead to all interest in sin, worldliness, and self? Do I long to be so closely identified with Jesus that I am of no value for anything except Him and His purposes? The great privilege of discipleship is that I can commit myself under the banner of His cross, and that means death to sin. You must get along with Jesus and either decide to tell Him that you do not want sin to die out in you, or that at any cost you want to be identified with His death. When you act in confident faith in what our Lord did on the cross, a supernatural identification with His death takes place immediately, and you will come to know through a higher knowledge that your old life was crucified with Him. Romans 6.6 6. The proof that your old life is dead, having been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20, is the amazing ease with which the life of God in you now enables you to obey the voice of Jesus Christ. Every once in a while our Lord gives us a glimpse of what we would be like if it were not for Him. This is a confirmation of what He said, Without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5 That is why the underlying foundation of Christianity is personal, passionate devotion, to the Lord Jesus. We mistake the joy of our first introduction into God's kingdom as His purpose for getting us there. Yet God's purpose in getting us into His kingdom is that we may realize all that identification with Jesus Christ means, His birth in history. That Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Luke 1.35 Jesus Christ was born into this world not from it. He did not emerge out of history. He came into history from the outside. Jesus Christ is not the best human being the human race can boast of. He is a being for whom the human race can take no credit at all. He is not man becoming God, but God incarnate God coming into human flesh from outside it. His life is the highest and the holiest entering through the most humble of doors. Our Lord's birth was an advent of the appearance of God in human form. His birth in me. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you. Galatians 4.19 Just as our Lord came into human history from outside it, He must also come into me from outside. Have I allowed my personal human life to become a Bethlehem? for the Son of God? I cannot enter the realm of the kingdom of God unless I am born again from above by a birth totally unlike physical birth. You must be born again. John 3, 7 This is not a command, but a fact based on the authority of God. The evidence of the new birth is that I yield myself so completely to God that Christ is formed in me. And once Christ is formed in me, 
his nature immediately begins to work through me. God evident in the flesh. This is what is made so pro-possible for you and for me through the redemption of man by Jesus Christ. Our battles are first won or lost in the secret places of our will in God's presence, never in full view of the world. The Spirit of God seizes me, and I am compelled to get alone with God and fight the battle before Him. Until I do this, I will lose every time. The battle may take one minute or one year, but that will depend on me, not God. However long it takes, I must wrestle with it alone before God, and I must resolve to go through the hell of renunciation or rejection before Him. Nothing has any power over someone who has fought the battle before God and won there. I should never say, I will wait until I get into difficulty circumstances, and then I'll put God to the test. Trying to do that will not work. I must first get the issue settled between God and myself in the secret places of my soul, where no one else can interfere. Then I can go ahead, knowing with certainty that the battle is won. Lose it there, and calamity, disaster, and defeat before the world are as sure as the laws of God. The reason the battle is lost is that I fight it first in the external world. Get alone with God, do battle before Him, and settle the matter once and for all. In dealing with other people, our stance should always be to drive them toward making a decision of their will. That is how surrendering to God begins. Not often, but every once in a while, God brings us to a major turning point, a great crossroads in our life. From that point, we either go toward a more and more slow, lazy, and useless Christian life, or we become more and more on fire, giving our utmost for His highest, our best for His glory. These words of our Lord refer to our initial conversion, but we should continue to turn to God as children, being con-converted every day of our lives. If we trust in our own abilities, instead of God's, we produce consequences for which God will hold us responsible. When God through His sovereignty brings us into new situations, we should make sure that our natural life submits to the spiritual, obeying the orders of the Spirit of God. Just because we have responded properly in the past is no guarantee that we will do so again. The response of the natural to the spiritual should be continuous conversion, but this is where we so often refuse to be obedient. No matter what our situation is, the Spirit of God remains unchanged and His salvation unaltered. But we must put on the new man, Ephesians 4.24. God holds us accountable every time we refuse to convert ourselves, and he sees our refusal as willful disobedience. Our natural life must not rule, God must rule in us. To refuse to be continuously converted puts a stumbling block in the growth of our spiritual life. There are areas of self-will in our lives where our pride pours contempt on the throne of God and says, I won't submit. We deify our independence and self-will and call them by the wrong name. What God sees as stubborn weakness, we call strength. There are whole areas of our lives that have not yet been brought into submission, and this can only be done by this continuous conversion. Slowly but surely we can claim the whole territory for the Spirit of God. Subscribe to our channel to help us reach 2,000 subscribers. Share this video to your loved ones. Donate us. Super thanks to support us. Type Amen to affirm. Thanks for watching.